What's up, everybody? Austin Summer here covering the EIWA and tonight's KC Ivy Leagues. I'm here with Princeton head coach Joe Dubuque. Coach, how are you? Good, Austin. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, should be a good, fun talk. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy family man. You just got back from softball game with your daughter there. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time. You know, talk to an idiot like me, you know, so I really appreciate that. Um, you got it. Before we get here, you kind of have two coaches about to be hired, you know, in the next few days or so, not official yet. So we can't, I don't want to release any names here. Um, but you said you can talk a little bit about them, you know, and, you know, brush broad strokes. Um, you know, so you've got two new guys coming in. Tell us a little bit about who they are without, you know, giving too much away. Yeah. So, you know, just, uh, you know, finishing up the, uh, the formalities, I guess, in the, within the hiring process. So, uh, yeah, not at liberty to, to announce yet. Uh, but I'm super excited about both of these individuals, uh, absolute hammers, uh, on the mat. And, um, you know, they have a, a, a good balance of like youth and experience, um, between the both of them. So, um, my staff will be will be made up of a lightweight coach, a middleweight coach, and an upperweight coach. Uh, so that's something that's really uh, really good for the program. Um, every guy on the team will have a, a coach that they can roll with. Um, uh, so I think that's important, right? Whenever you have a coach that's in your corner, uh, you want to be able to, you know, not 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 so much trust, not not in regards to like trust, but you have rolled with them. You understand. They understand you. They understand the positions that you're you're good in. The the ones that you're not good in. So it just gives you an uh, an extra um, level of comfort when you have the guy in the corner uh, in your corner that you roll with on a on a consistent basis. So um, so yeah. Again, I'm I'm really excited uh, about both of them. Um, one of the guys is a national champ, and that'll bring three NCAA champs to the coaching staff. I don't know if there are any coaching staffs in the country that have three NCAA uh, champs on staff. I haven't done my research, so I'm just throwing that out there. I could be wrong. There could be 10. Who knows? Uh, but I think that's something that is extraordinary, and I am like just super pumped uh, to be able to, when the time is right, uh, to announce these guys to the, to the world. Yeah, that should be fun. Um, yeah. Just kind of going back to what you said about coaches and athletes really clicking. I felt like there was a lot of that with you and Pat glory. You know, he was kind of, he was your guy, you were his guy, he, you were in his corner, you know, through the long, the tough and, you know, all, all four years that he was there. So I, I think you guys really do a good way of, getting the right people in the corners with the right wrestlers. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's about relationships. Um, you know, the best coaches in the country, they form relationships with their athletes. Um, and again, through that relationship, you build trust. Um, and I think that's something that me and Pat glory had. Um, he trusted me. I trusted him. Uh, there was, you know, not, it wasn't all, you know, uh, you know, sunshine and rainbows, right? It was, you know, we had our our down times and we had our up times. So um, for us, it was like, uh, it was almost like going through the adversity built the relationship even stronger. You know, our bond was even stronger. So, um, you know, again, and and it, my career was was totally filled with, uh, you know, a, it was like a roller coaster. Um, and so I think that kind of helped Pat relate to me a little bit too, right? Because like I said, you know, I, I experienced a lot throughout my career, a lot of adversity. So, um, so when he was going through those dark times and, and hard times, um, it was easy for him to kind of lean on me. Um, and I told him to, right. And I said, that's what I'm here for. You know, I'm your coach, lean on me, you know, let me, let me do whatever I can, uh, to kind of take some things off your plate, take, take things off, you know, off your shoulders a little bit. Um, and make this, you know, this training and this competition a little bit easier on you. So, um, so yeah. And I think again, um, the new coaches that come in, they're going to build relationships with the athletes and it, it, it really happens organically, right? It's not like, oh yeah, you go with him and you go with him and this is how it goes. Um, it just, that's just how it goes. You know, I mean, there was a lot of guys that, that I, um, 
that I kind of meshed well with, uh, that were upperweights, right. You know, I never, never had my hands on them, you know, never rolled with them, but it was just, you know, kind of personalities were, were similar, uh, backgrounds were similar. So again, it, it, it kind of works itself out, you know, who, who the guys are in the corner. Yeah. It's always funny. My favorite of all time is usually when Darian Cruz was helping out at Lehigh and he was in Jordan Woods corner. You just see a little Darian Cruz who's half the size of Jordan giving him a shot, you know, but they mesh so well. It, it, it's just funny how you say that. Yep. Um, yeah, let's go. You said one of your coaches is a national champ. We do know Cody Brewer is uh, new to staff, right? Um, he came from Virginia Tech. So talk a little bit about how that came about and what attracted you to him exactly and what drew him into Princeton. Yeah. So, I mean, I think going back to just his competition uh, career, you know, his competitive career, uh, super fun to watch. I felt like, um, you know, just watching him, his style of wrestling is definitely the brand of wrestling that we want at Princeton, right? He was uh, super aggressive, always looking to score points. Uh, I mean, exciting, uh, you know, throwing guys on their head and and going for, you know, the pin all the time. And, um, you know, that's that's something that, you know, I preach and I want guys to get behind. Um, you know, we talk about that a lot, our brand of wrestling, tough, aggressive, exciting, you know, what does that look like in regards to your style? And I think, uh, I think Cody embodies all three of those, uh, those words, you know, that we talk about frequently. Um, so, you know, again, that, you know, just me from a, from a, you know, a fan's perspective, I was like drawn to his style of wrestling. Uh, and then when he got into coaching, uh, the first time I think I coached against him, he was um, uh, in Sebastian Rivera's corner um, and and him and Pat Glory wrestled in uh, the Conti semis in a barn burner. Oh, my God. It was like back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and Sebastian wind up, you know, kind of pulling it out in the end. Um, and, uh, you know, just going over to Cody because uh, I think he was he was either like one or two years uh you know, in, in the coaching. Uh, and I said, man, you know, like obviously Sebastian's, uh, you know, he's a hammer, but you know, you're, you've got a bright future ahead of you. Um, just when, you know, I, I observe a lot of things, you know, of, of coaches and how they, how they relate and, and, uh, you know, how they are with their athletes. Um, so again, that was just, you know, my first experience, uh, in regards to like him as a coach. Um, and then I got to know him a little bit more when he got down to Virginia tech, um, it seemed like, man, whenever I was on the road recruiting, that dude was on the road recruiting. And it seemed like who I was talking to, that guy was talking to. And I'm like, man, this guy is, he is a hustler. He is, he works his tail off. Um, and so again, you know, for me, I'm, I was, you know, I'm, I'm older. Right. And, and my goals were, you know, my goal is always to be a head coach. Right. And when, when that's your goal, you, you're looking at like, Hey, who, who would I bring in? Right. Who would, who, who could help me, um, achieve the goals that I want for this, for any program. Right. Uh, so he was a guy when I started to get, uh, get contacted for head coaching positions, you know, that was a guy who I was like, man, who would I bring in? And, and I kept coming back to his name. Um, and, um, you know, I wound up turning down a, a coaching position. I wound up talking to him like a short time after. Uh, I think we were at Fargo. And I said, hey, man, I was like, you know, I didn't take this position, but you were like at the top of my list. I go, would you, you know, would you come, you know, would you come and coach with me? He's like, well, he's like, you know, obviously he's like, I really respect you. He's like, but the place has got to be right, blah, blah, blah. You know, just kind of like, you know, short talk. Uh, I said, well, I'm just going to let you know, man, if I get a head coaching job, you're going to be the first call I make. Um, and he's like, oh, I appreciate that. And sure enough, you know, like when I got the Princeton job, he was literally the first phone call I, I made. Um, and um, I, I tried to get him in the fall and it just wasn't good timing for him. And I totally understood. And I knew it was a long shot, you know, just the timing of me getting the job. Um, I knew it was a long shot, uh, but I at least wanted to kind of, put the message out there. Right. And, and tell him like, Hey man, like, you know, again, you were, you know, you were my first phone call. Um, so I, I totally got his, uh, his loyalty to his guys and his program and the timing was, was not right. I mean, we're, you know, probably about a couple of weeks, uh, weeks away from, from starting the season. Um, so, you know, again, I, I didn't really, I never talked to him really after that. Um, 
you know, because I, I respected the fact that he's working for another university. Uh, but, you know, a couple of days after NCAAs uh, were, was over, I gave him another call and I said, hey, you know, I got this position open and uh, I want to know if you want to come out and, and at least check it out. And I told him, I said, hey, you know, whether you want to take it or not, you'd be foolish not to come out and at least yeah. take or at least, you know, try and, and go through the interview process just for your own experience. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, he came out and, you know, I think he loved, uh, he loved Princeton. He loved the vision. Uh, I, I think me and him, um, see eye to eye on a lot of things. So, um, so again, I mean, I see a lot of the qualities, uh, you know, in him that I have myself. Right. And I think that's something I want. I don't want a guy who is a hard worker and a uh, guy's passionate guy who, who builds relationships with his guys. Um, and, and like I said, embodies the things that we want our guys to embody. So, um, so yeah, I could, I couldn't be more excited about Cody. Uh, he's up here now uh, spending a couple of weeks training with the guys uh, until we leave for U 23s. Um, and he's already making, you know, an immediate impact on, on, you know, myself you know just being in the office and and wanting to learn and eager to to do more and and have more responsibility uh and then also just kind of in the room right like he's a he's a hands-on guy um and so like you know honestly the the sky's the limit for this program uh with the guys that i'm gonna have in place yeah it's now it seems like you're very I shouldn't say confident because you're always confident, you know, not in a bad way, but you know, it seems like you're really set yeah. on the guys you want. You're really in there now. Um, like you mentioned last year, you got the job and what was it like September, you know, it was like late in the game. Yeah. So I feel like there were so many moving parts last year. You didn't, you wouldn't really have time to take a step back and breathe to get maybe ev all the ducks in a row you wanted. Right. I feel like now that the first season kind of has gone by, you know, how, how you feeling was that a good experience for you not having everything in place and kind of going on the fly or was that, Oh, this is what it is kind of deal. Yeah. So, uh, so like I said, I mean, I, I opened up, uh, I opened up the positions, um, in September again, just to, just to see if anybody was interested, you know, again, I, I made a few phone calls, but, um, but once I kind of realized that, Hey, not too many guys are going to leave where they're at, um, yeah. basically almost at the end of preseason, um, I was like, all right, so you know, we just, we kind of go through the season with who we have. Um, and I talked to Quincy Monday and, and said, Hey buddy, like, and, and he was like, Hey, I want to help you guys, but I'm really, wa I really want to train. Right. And so, um, you know, with the coaching staff that we had in place when I was an assistant, uh, it would allowed him to, to really kind of, uh, you know, give us help, but also really focus on himself too, and, and just train um, while also helping out the program that he loves. Um, so uh, I told him, hey, nothing changes in regards to you, right? Um, even though we're down uh, a few positions, I want you to, to uh, solely focus on yourself. Uh, obviously, when you're in the room, you, you know, you try and be a coach, but, you know, I'm not going to have you do any, you know, real paperwork or stuff like that. Like you being in the room is is help. Right. And and these guys uh, seeing you and seeing what you did here at Princeton, um, you can relate to them. Right. And they can definitely talk to you about your experiences with classes and with wrestling uh, and how you overcame uh, just the rigors of both, right? I mean, you know, it's uh, the number one school in the country. Uh, we usually have one of the hardest schedules uh, in D1 wrestling. So, um, so he can he can relate to all the guys uh, in the room. Um, so for me, it was like I was I was kind of doing everything on my own, uh, which was a good and a bad thing, right? It was obviously stressful, right? Really, really stressful uh, trying to figure out what, you know, three other positions were supposed to be responsible for uh, and be doing it. Uh, but then also it was great because it gave me that experience because now when I have three coaches on staff, it's, you know, it's going to be so seamless. And, you know, ev everybody's going to have, you know, their job responsibilities. And I kind of, I already have it running through my head where I, I want to, I see guys, uh, the areas that I see guys in. Um, 
so again, yeah, it was stressful going through uh, that, you know, my first year, but man, it, it, it made me, it, it gave me a, an opportunity to learn so much. And I thought I, I knew a lot too, you know, I thought I was like super, super prepared, which, you know, I think I was. And I think again, if the circumstances were a little different and uh, I had a full staff, I think, I think things would have been a little bit easier, but I wouldn't trade that because, again, I, I, I really believe it's making me a better head coach um, moving forward. So, um, so yeah, you know, it was tough. Uh, and, you know, again, we had a young team um, and dealt with a lot of adversity. But I am uh, I'm super excited for this next year. It's going to be it's going to be really awesome. Yeah, I mean, being the head coach at a, a D1 program is stressful enough. You're playing three roles, right? But. One thing you didn't have to worry about was NIL and and transfer portal stuff. You know, it's not really not really an Ivy League thing, right? Um, you had a funny tweet a few weeks ago. It was like, hey, what's this portal thing? What's this NIL's talk everyone's doing? Um, so what you know, what's your thought process on what that looks like in the current state? Um, you know, just sitting back and watching all the madness happen, I guess. So uh so yeah, that was a funny tweet, but I mean it's 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 so true. I have no idea how to get on it. <laughs> like I think you have to have a, a login and a password and stuff no. like that. I have no idea. So when it first came out, this por the portal thing came out, um, it was probably like 2020, 2021, or I forget when it was. And I was like, hey, I was like, I was actually just curious. I was like, man, I would, you know, I just want to see what it is, you know, go on there. So I had to like contact my compliance officer and said, and they're like, oh yeah, you get, you know, everybody has this. So I, I literally I was on there one time. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, just with uh, the, the admissions process at Princeton, it's, it's nearly impossible. Uh, now that doesn't mean that it's impossible. Uh, I, I will say that we would be uh, able to get like a one-time transfer but the the um the circumstances have to be so perfect you mm -hmm. know what i mean um so like if a kid you know finished uh finishes first year maybe at a really high academic school you know like a stanford or a um or a michigan or you know something like that right and then decided hey i want to get in the, the transfer portal um I would say we would have a shot, but if we did ever get a guy out of the transfer portal, like to actually transfer in, like I probably wouldn't be able to use it again. Right. It's like, it's like almost like a one-time thing um, has to be like kind of a superstar or something like that. But like I said, the, the, the circumstances have to be so right uh, that, you know, it's it's almost like it almost cuts my already ridiculously high, you know, admission standards down to like almost like a, a zero zero or, you know, point zero one percent. Um, so, you know, again, I don't even I don't even waste time or energy like looking at it or or seeing, you know, what it is. Um, and sometimes it gets a little annoying where, you know, you see other schools just literally just every year they're just propping up their, you know, their lineup where they, you know, lost a guy and whatever, where, you know, sometimes like, man, the natural course of things, sometimes you have a bad year. Right. And that was because you didn't recruit well for a year or something like that. And that's, that's what we have to do. Right. Like I have to make sure that we are recruiting we are developing and we're, we're retaining these guys, right? Those are like the three words we have to, we have to live by. Uh, I, I don't have the luxury to say, oh man, I have a, a hole at, you know, 174 this year. Let me go in the transfer portal and see what I can plug in for a year and give this guy, you know, this stud freshman, give him a, a you know, a red shirt year and, and then he'll, he'll pop in after that. So I will say, yeah, that is annoying to my, but again, I, I can't let that, I can't let that, um, spend too much time in my mind, right? I can't spend too much time on that because then I would just go crazy, right? There's nothing I can do. Um, so I try and focus on our guys. I try and focus on our recruiting, um, philosophies and what we're trying to accomplish, uh, for each class. And that's it. Um, you know, the, the transfer portal, I think is a good thing, but I also think that 
it's just like anything, just like any rule, any new thing that comes, it gets abused. It gets, it gets used for the, all the wrong reasons. Um, but the whole thing is, is that you have coaches who are competitive and want to win and they're going to, they're going to try and, you know, circumvent every new rule and every new opportunity to better their team. And as long as they're somewhat staying within the rules. And I mean, here's the thing, if nobody's going to hold them accountable, then what's the sense of not doing it? Um, so I don't know. Those are my few thoughts on it. Um, but like I said, uh, it was a jokingly uh, thing I uh, put on Twitter, but I don't really, again, I, I don't even know what's going on with the transfer. I mean, I look on X and, and see what everybody's talking about just for the entertainment of it. But, you know, it's, it'll never really affect us. Yeah. The thing that, especially in the last few years due to COVID, you know, it's the graduate students looking for another home, right? A lot of guys from Cornell, Harvard, you know, Columbia, you know, a few Penn guys here and there. Um, they graduate from the Ivy League and they can't compete at the same school. You know, that's just Ivy League rules, right? So they have to go to a non-Ivy school. So you guys don't have that luxury of recruiting graduate students to wrestle for you as grads, you know? So again, you're kind of behind the eight ball there too, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, and those are the guys who deserved it the most, right? I yeah. Mean, the Ivy League, uh, you know, got screwed the most, I I, I think. Um, you know, you, you're giving kids who uh, weren't, weren't even in college and you're giving them extra years. And then you have a kid who is, you know, a senior and it's his last shot and you won't give him a year. Uh, because he's at an Ivy League or or he, you know, wrestled, uh, wrestled the conference tournament and you won't give him another year. So, you know, we've experienced that. We've lost guys, um, you know, because of those extra years. And uh, but I, I don't fault them. Right. It's they, they are dealing with um, the uh, the circumstances that were dealt uh, to them. And they can, they should absolutely take advantage of, you know, those, that extra year. Um, but man, I'm like, I'm so ready for these guys to be done. I mean, it's like, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know who's, I, I look and I'm like, how's that kid have another year of eligibility? Uh, yeah. and, and then I look and he's got two more years of eligibility. I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know how that happens. So it's, I mean, it's becoming, uh, it's just like, whatever, I guess, you know, it's just confusing, right? Nobody knows what the, the eligibility is, uh, you know, so, um, but yeah, we, the, the Ivy league definitely did not um, got the short end of the stick uh, when it comes to that. And I'm glad that these kids are able to, to again, use the transfer por portal to, you know, go get an MBA, go get a graduate degree that is really meaningful to them. Uh, and then also, you know, use your, use their last year of eligibility. So I'm happy that they're able to do that. Yeah. And not to keep ragging on this point, but you kind of mentioned Ivy League's got screwed and it took talk, just talking to coaches that are in the Ivies, you really had to keep guys out of classes because that would count for a year of eligibility for them. So they had to like defer a year you know, wrestle at the RTC you guys have and not take any classes and come back a year later to stop their clock. So it's a lot of moving parts for you guys too. you know, indirectly, you know, from things like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just going back. Juggle, to, yeah. Yeah. So just going back to the, uh, the 20, the 2020, 2021 season when the Ivy league, you know, canceled the the season. Right. And, and wouldn't let us wrestle, um, you know, that the, the, our whole junior class, kind of withdrew from school, right? Because they didn't want to burn a year of eligibility. Um, and I and and the thing for us is the the coaches, uh, it meant a lot because they could have they could have stayed in school and and still still got an extra year um after, but they were like, no, I want to I'm I'm gonna finish out my career at Princeton. So it's like almost like hey they're gonna finish what they started here here at Princeton and and um so like for those guys to do that um, and sacrifice, you know, a year of their eligibility to stay at Princeton was it, it, it did. It meant a lot. And and again, they 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 saw they saw the vision through, um, you know, Quincy and, and and Pat coming coming off of that year, both made the national finals. And that's when it was like, yes, like that's why you did that. You did. You took the year off for this, um, you know, and then then, you know, with Pat 
punching through and and winning our first national championship in 71 or 72 years. Um, again, it, it's like, you know, you get a little emotional because, you know, you know, the year and a half to two years that they went through. Right. Where we couldn't even get in our wrestling room for literally a year and a half, year and a half couldn't get in our wrestling. Um, so um, for them to go through that type of adversity and come back and um, get, you know, have the level of success that they had, it, it just it's a testament to, you know, their character and their love of Princeton wrestling. Um, and I mean, you know, myself and the program are, are forever indebted to that class. I mean, then they they come back or, you know, they they helped us win our first, you know, uh, Ivy League championship. And again, like 36 years. So so a lot, you know, a lot went went in that, you know, their their four years, um, you know, but now now we're now we have guys who are coming in and they saw what that class did and now they want to do more. Right. And I think we have classes and we have guys who uh, want to become, you know, multiple time national champs uh, and they want to win Ivy league championships on a regular basis. And um, you know, they want to place in the top 10 and they want to compete to compete for a, a team trophy. So, so they, they definitely put their stamp on the program and they, they set the bar high, but I think we have guys who want to blow through that bar. Yeah, like you said, you got you had a young team last year, a little inexperienced, took some lumps, but you know you got guys that were deferring a year. You know, some were injured coming back. So, yeah, I think you guys have a fun year this year, and this year will be different because you guys, are, the Ivy League in, in general, right, is going to have their own conference tournament, kind of breaking out from the EIWA. Um, talking to other coaches, I've I've said my you know I'm I have mixed mixed feelings for it. Ivy League, you know, they're they're their own conference historical you know they should get their own but i the eiwa has just been such a traditional conference for over 120 years now right so i i see both sides of it you know what what's your thought process there and you know you collectively at princeton yeah obviously just to you know first talk about just the ivy league championship um you know the the inaugural um ivy league championships will be held at Princeton, um, which is awesome. You know, we are very excited to host that. Um, and then just to talk about, you know, just kind of the thought process that went into it. Um, when you look at actually this past year, I think it was like 40, 47% of the pre-allocated sp uh, spots were Ivy League wrestlers, right? So, so you have six teams doing almost half of the work in a 17 team conference. Um, so, you yeah, know, for us, it's like, coach, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and it's, well, again, it's, um, you know, and that's what that's, that was the thought process, right? It's like, yeah. why, why are we going to be doing almost half of the work and then still have to go through a two day meat grinder. And again, there's, there's tough teams up and down the lineup, right? I mean, you know, again, Lehigh, you have the the academies, uh, you know, just a lot of a lot of things could go wrong, right? In a two day yeah. tournament, yeah. right? Uh, even if you're even if you allocate one of the spots and they take top four, you lose in the quarterfinals. You got to win another, you know, two or three more matches just to get just to get in in the third fourth place match. So. Uh, I think that was the thought process of like, hey, again, if we're if if we're doing almost half the work, we we should almost kind of. Uh, I wouldn't say not create an easier path, right, because it's not easier, especially with the Ivy League uh, teams getting better uh, mm -hmm. overall. Um, but I think make it a less of a grind on our guys. Right. Even if they do, even if they don't even if they don't qualify, right. And they, you know, one weight takes top three and they, they place fourth. Hey, I mean, they only wrestled maybe two or three matches uh, and they're right outside. You know, that's a, that's a big uh, criteria now is one outside, right. Where yeah. again, you know, say, say it was, you know, top five go at the EIWA and you, and you play seventh, like you're two spots out, even though you probably had a good tournament, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so also we talked about just kind of the Ivy League um, uh, brand in general. It's just more recognizable. Um, and I'm not going to say we're going to we're going to take fans off the streets that never 
watch a wrestling match and they're going to be like, oh, the Ivy League wrestling championships are happening today. I might go check it out. But I will say, I think if you have, um, if you have fans, uh, especially like within the Ivy League, they kind of, they, they can get behind the Ivy League, right? Like that was what they went to school for. They went to whatever school they went to, whether it was Penn, Cornell, Columbia, Princeton, whatever, they went to get an Ivy League education. So like they can relate to, you know, the Ivy League tournament. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we can absolutely build on. And I think the Ivy League in general is going to, is going to make a great presentation uh, for the tournament. They're going to really kind of like roll out the red carpet for it um, and make it something that it is a tournament that fans can get behind and, and almost again, treat it like the EIWA. Uh, then you look back at, you know, kind of the, the cons, right. And it's, it's the prestige, right. And it's the history of the EIWA, right. Um, you know, Princeton being one of the, the, the founding uh, teams for the conference, uh, it means a lot to our, our alumni and it means a lot to us. Um, but just like anything, in order for, you know, something to grow, you got to change. Um, and I feel like this is definitely the change that is going to help everybody involved. Yeah, just I, I agree with everything you said. And it's just, you know, back to that first point you mentioned, the meat grind of the tournament. That For me as a fan, that's what I love the IWA tournament because you, you could bring five, six guys and upsets happen someone gets hurt it busts open the bracket and it's like who the heck is this guy he was under 500 but he qualified for nationals you know that's the stuff that you know i like to see as a fan but you know, like you said it's why do all the work and then go through that ruling two-day tournament yeah i agree with everything you said there i'll give you one example one quick example so marshall keller three years ago uh we're up at cornell he's the 16th seed all right didn't have a great regular season wins his first his the pigtail then runs into Yanni Diakamahalis, loses, and then goes on a run on the backside. Winds up, you know, it was top four uh, go to NCAAs. He wind up taking fourth, but he literally had eight matches in two days. Like he had like an, like his eye was like this. His, you know, his head was wrapped up. His shoulder was falling off. I mean, it was literally like, but it was, a, it was a great accomplishment for him. And, and I think, but if we could do that where he could just, win two matches, right? <laughs> or wrestle three matches instead of eight. I think we'll take that. Yeah, that was quite a run he had up there at Cornell. That was that was that was fun to watch. Just coming back in the backside. Like what where's Marshall Keller coming from? This is awesome. But um yeah coach I got another minute or two here. Open the floor to you. Um whatever you want to say. If not we can you know Yeah I mean just uh just exciting things that are gonna happen next year. Um uh we are going to have like a couple guys coming off of gray shirts. Uh, Mark Anthony McGowan uh, will be coming off of a gray shirt. Uh, really excited to see, uh, you know, see him in the lineup. Uh, he was one of the best recruits coming out of high school. Um, Ty Whalen uh, also coming off of a gray shirt, um, you know, where he beat two uh, all Americans this year to win a Midlands championship. Yeah. Uh, and then Cole, Cole Mulhauser, um, we'll be going up a weight. He'll be wrestling 184 this year. Uh, just placed out at U twenties, wind up winning the Michigan state open beating, you know, a couple of good, uh, good NCAA qualifiers. So, uh, I think we're going to have a, uh, an immediate, um, injection of, uh, energy and talent, uh, into the lineup next year. Uh, so I, I really feel like, um, you know, we can have a, a complete 180 uh, from what we experienced this year. But again, it's like we had a, a young, talented team this year that I think with what with, you know, again, with this year of experience, uh, I think these guys can absolutely break out next year um, and be all Americans, you know, and, and you know, compete for national championships. So. Uh, very exciting things happening in Princeton. Again, I can't wait till I'm able to, to announce these hires. Um, I think it's going to be, uh, again, it's going to be ground shaking. You know, I know we're dealing with the Oklahoma state news, you know, I might have to put a couple of days in between, uh, that and, and David Taylor getting announced. But I think, uh, but again, for in wrestling news, I think this is going to be big. It's huge for our program. Um, like I said, exciting things happening down in Princeton. Awesome. 
Coach, love it. Thanks for the thanks for the time here. Like like you said, exciting things happen. New coaches and new teams, uh, new young guys coming up, ready to take over. Appreciate it, Austin. Always always appreciate the time, man. Awesome, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care. And stop that recording. However, you stop it.